But it says it's going to warm up a little bit later, so just be excited for that. Jordan's got his, his, his printed shirt on for today because he's hopeful for that warm weather. And so, But anyways, please stand with me as we open up service and just for the first few songs and the reading of this scripture. And so today we're going to be reading Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. It says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Lord, we're so thankful to be here, to be present in your house this morning. Lord, we know circumstances and trials come up, and it doesn't matter what we walk through. Lord, we know that you're walking with us, and so we ask and pray, Lord, that the song could not leave our, our mouth, Lord, and the joy of you cannot leave our hearts. And so we, we ask and pray, Lord, that you fill this place, place with your spirit this morning and we could go forth and just glorify you. And so, Lord, we love you. Be with the worship team. Be with Jordan, Lord. Just fill this place with your spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen. Remember those walls, remember those walls that we call sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape, but he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants, remember those giants we call death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God But this is our God This is who he is He loves us This is our God This is what he does He saves us He bore the cross Beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray.
nobody but Jesus who pulled me out of that pit. He did, he did, who paid for all of our sin. Nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise. Nobody but Jesus who rescued me from that grave. Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. Oh, this is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is. Lord, help us to see that you are always in our midst, Lord. You're always doing a work, Lord, that we can't see or even understand sometimes, Lord. Lord, even the work you do in ourselves, Lord, we can be so oblivious to what your spirit wants to do, Lord. Lord, the things we need to take out of our lives, Lord, that we would uh, put in the spirit, Lord, that we wouldn't live by the lust of the flesh, God. Would you help us to see, Lord, reveal it, Lord, who we are in you, who you desire us to be in Christ, be here as we continue to worship the Lord. Feel free to take a seat if you'd like to. Feel free to stand however you feel comfortable.
I doubt it, Lord, remind me. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me. I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. So when I doubt it, Lord, remind me. I'd rather be no place I'd rather be no place I'd rather be than here in your love here in your love there's no place I'd rather be no place I'd rather be no place I'd rather be than here in your love here in your love Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God Set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God No place I'd rather be There's no place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be Than here in your love, here in your love There's no place I'd rather be There's no place I'd rather be There's no place I'd rather be That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God To set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be, no 
place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be Than here in your love Here in your love Yes, Lord, you are good Lord, we are home when we were here in your spirit, Lord. We're here in your house, God. We're gathered together, Lord. We're singing. And we want to see your glory, Lord, in our lives. We want to see you displayed for the world to see through us, Lord. The world doesn't need any more of me, Lord. It's got enough of that junk, Lord. It needs to see Jesus. So would you... Continue, Lord, to paint your picture, Lord. Would you mold us, Lord, with your hands? Purify us and, Lord, do your will, Lord. Whatever you have for us, Lord, that's what we want. And, Lord, we know you are love. And all love, perfect love casts out all fear, Lord. We're not afraid, Lord, to let you do what you want with us. Lord, we rest in that. Lord, you are our peace. So have your way. We give it to you. Lord, speak your word to us this morning. May it go deep, Lord. May it be powerful. By your spirit, we receive. Open our eyes, Lord. We love you. Show us more of yourself, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's greet one another this morning. Say hi. Would you guys welcome Patrick up here? He's got something to say to y'all this morning. Hello, good morning. Um, so my name is Patrick. I'm one of the students at CCBCHU, um, and I'm here to announce our rent student program. Uh, so basically, as you can see on the flyer, um, we go out and do uh, different tasks for you guys, whether you need us to do yard work or cleaning, uh, painting a house, babysitting, whatever. Um, so yeah, we... We'll do any of that kind of work. You just call this number. Uh, talk to Evan Sicarella. Uh, we can plan that stuff out. Preferably Mondays. 
Um, and then you guys afterward can give a donation to us, um, and that will go to our practicum trip, um, which is this spring. So yeah, that's pretty much all I have to announce. Sweet, thanks, man. <laughs> Great job. <clears throat> There's, there's a few, a few other things you can see. Um, you can call or text Evan there. And then there's a parents' night out, February 22nd. The Bible College hosts that so that you couples can go off and have a nice Valentine's Day type of a thing. You can get away and have a date. And bring your kids. They'll watch them, take care of them, love them. And then uh, you guys go have some fun. Um, also, after third service, there is a pancake dinner. And this is a fundraiser for the Bible College Practicum as well. And so today's service is sponsored by uh, CCBCHU. So <laughs> this is brought to you by them. But we'd love for you guys to join us afterwards to eat some pancakes. Um, they're going to be going to a couple different locations, still trying to iron that out, what it'll look like. But it looks like they'll, a group will go to Ecuador and uh, help uh, get Danny Posadas and family and crew established there in Ecuador, and then also they're thinking about sending a group up to uh, Matt Schroeder up in Wisconsin and do some work up there with him. So that's the plan. But anyway, you guys can support and help. They obviously would really appreciate it. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, it's in your bulletin. There's a lot of really important things. So if you would just like read it when I'm talking, you know, when you're bored, um, check it out. Uh, but uh, if you want a physical receipt, like a tithe receipt of, of uh, your yearly giving, would you please let us know and we will get one to you? Otherwise, we're going to email those who have it on, on, uh, on, we have it on file. So whatever you want, we'll do. Default right now will be an email, but if you need a, a copy of it, um, please let us know and we'll get one to you as fast as we can. We'll have them there at the info center for you. Okay. <clears throat> Acts chapter 21. <clears throat> Let's uh, set this time aside once again, and then we'll start reading and getting into it. So, Jesus, we ask for your help navigating through all of this, that your spirit would, would give us understanding. Um, speak very clearly to us, Lord, and we, we do set this time aside to hear from you, and we need it. As your people, God, we submit ourselves to the authority of your word, and just want to say, speak, Father, have your way. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, let, let the guys know. Acts chapter 21, Paul just got done saying, I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And today, we're going to look at the time when Paul almost dies. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> oh, man, I forgot a bunch of other announcements. Man, I'm sorry. <laughs> just bear with me for a second. <clears throat> Pizza with pastors, March 3rd. If you're new to the fellowship or newer or you like pizza, then would you, would you sign up and let us know? Because we'd love to meet with you. It's just a real fast chance for you to get to know us a little bit more and who we are, um, our background, what we're all about. And then a chance we usually go and, and split up into small groups and different pastors will just tour campus. Um, we've got 100 acres of campus all over here. And um, we'd love to show you what, what goes on and things like that. Men's breakfast is next, or this coming Saturday. And also, uh, in big news, why so I cannot, cannot forget to announce this, is this next Sunday, we're going to be having a baptism service. And there are several who are already wanting to be baptized, but if there are others, um, we, we would invite you. Uh, this is a good chance for it. So we do that after third service, um, usually around 1245. So we invite you, if you'd like to be a part of that, would you either call the front office and talk to Becky or send, send her an email or send me an email, and we'll contact you with that. And then also we're starting um, a church planning uh, Sunday session. So that's going to be taking place like right now, I think in February. Levi is teaching that. So um, there we go. I've done it. If you don't mind, Bailey, throw that graphic up there that's got like, the yellow on it and the lines that are slanty. There you go. I wanted to throw something up there that you couldn't read <laughs> so we can just pretend like we're doing something cool. But I want to give you a really fast, like this is where we are. You'll notice the yellow where you have the yellow highlighter. That is where we find ourselves in the book of Acts, a transition from the church extends overseas and Paul's missionary journeys to now 
Paul is on trial, and we're going to see that happen right here today. But this is where we are, and you'll notice some of the dates that are there to give you an idea. We're going to go through uh, an even better chronology than this. Um, but this is a fun little graphic that just helps you break down the book of Acts and where we've been and, and also where we're going. You can keep that up there and keep looking at it as we read. <clears throat> um, I'm going to start verses 15 through 25, and then we'll pick up the rest later. Um, we're going we're to go all the way to verse 36 by the grace of God as he slows down time. So he says in verse 15, after those days, we uh, packed and we went up to Jerusalem. And also some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought, us a, and brought with them a certain Manasin, this is the guy's name, Manasin, of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in to James, and all the elders were present. And when we had greeted them, he told them in detail, that's every single detail is kind of what that word means, those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. I love how that's um, noted by Luke. Uh, it was what God had done. T please note that, okay? Notice what God had done. Now, we've read all the things that God has done. That's like the book of Acts. Now, they would have gotten a much more detailed version of it. But these are things that God has done. Not Paul, not Peter, not anybody else. Now, God worked through them, but it's what God had done. You know why? Because I can't and you can't do anything apart from God and his spirit in you. It's a work that he alone does. I just must point that out. I have an underline in my Bible because it's so important that we recognize and never forget that it is God who does the work. It's simple. It keeps you humble and it keeps me humble, okay, which is really important and sometimes hard. Humble. It's God who does it, not me. But it's a privilege to be used by God, isn't it? To, be join, to join him in the work that he is doing. That's exactly what Paul did. That's what we get to do. Uh, when they had heard all the things that, that Paul had listed, that God had done, look what it says. It says they glorified the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Um, that means that they praised God. So they hear that God had visited in a powerful way people in Philippi and Colossae, and Athens, and Berea. He had gone to Ephesus, and the Holy Spirit was poured out in Ephesus. Um, Colossae, all the different places they had gone. And the Jews that were there in Jerusalem, they're like, God, you're so good. Praise God for how powerful and how awesome he is. They had a little worship session. They were considering the amazing work of God throughout the known world there, and they were just absolutely amazed. They praised God. And gave him glory. And they said to him afterwards, it's a little bit of a strange thing. Hey, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. And you're like, Paul, I'm so excited to hear the work that God's doing outside of Jerusalem. But man, let me tell you what God's been doing here in Jerusalem. So many myriads of Jews who have believed and they're zealous for the law. It means exactly what you'd think it means. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying they ought not circumcise their children, nor walk according to their customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them. Pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads, and they all may know that those things which they were informed concerning you are nothing." but that you yourself walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. We'll pause there. We're going to reset back to 15, and some of these we're going we're to really zero in on certain things, and then we're going to go quickly through the others. But this is Paul and Jay, with James in the church, and there was a group of guys who had came with them, but I want you to consider this. I want you to think about what kind of uh, anticipation Paul would have had traveling to Jerusalem. Because for months, if not years, he knew he was supposed to go to Jerusalem, and he knew that once he got there, he was going to get beat up. He was going to be bound and experience trials when he got there. So what's it like walking into that scenario? 
right? You guys maybe can anticipate or think through situations where you're walking into a counseling situation and you know it's going to be confrontational. You know it's going to be hard. You know that um, it, there's an anticipation or an anxiety that comes from anticipating those types of things, right? When you're a kid, um, and I remember when I would do things that weren't correct, which was often enough, um, I got the whole, you just wait till your dad gets home. And so then there was that anticipation <laughs> where I knew when my dad got home, it was going to get bad. <laughs> I was going to get it. And so I'm scared for a long time. You know, I'm worried and anxious, you know, what's going to happen. And uh, I'd get it. <laughs> That's how it goes, you know. I had plenty of those opportunities, and I earned every bit of it. <clears throat> um, but those, that, that anxious thought, what was going through Paul's mind as he's walking to Jerusalem? How long until he, like, would he step foot in Jerusalem and then all of a sudden it would, get down, it would go down? Or would he have a couple days? Like, when he's going to the temple, like, is it going to happen now? Is it not? You know, what's it like walking in there for months? Back in Acts chapter 18, Paul said that he must keep the coming feast. And that kind of began this, this time where he's trying to get to Jerusalem by a certain period in time. In Acts 20, or 19, verse 21, Paul purposed in his spirit, I got to get to Jerusalem. And then after that, I'm going to go to Rome. In Acts chapter 20, 22 through 23, the Holy Spirit testified. This is what Paul was saying. All I know is the Holy Spirit testifies in every city that trials and tribulations await me when I get to Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 21, more recent history, you might remember that through the Spirit, they demonstrated that he shouldn't go to Jerusalem. And we're like, what exactly does that mean? And was Paul wrong to go to Jerusalem? And we talked about how in verse 12 of chapter 21, Agabus came, took Paul's belt, bound himself, and says, this guy who owns the belt, he's going to be bound in Jerusalem. And then everybody began to plead with Paul, don't go. <clears throat> They're interpreting these signs as don't go. And it's like a, a reminder, I think, even today, <clears throat> that to be very frank, God, his priority is not your safety. Um, and some of you have to wrestle through that. We live in a day and age where you're like, your safety is like worshiped. I just want to be real with you guys. God is not, that's not his priority. He does care for you. He does watch out for you. He has done something so much greater then keep you safe. He has saved you from eternal damnation. And, and now you get to, because you have been set free, you get to worship him and you get to bring him glory, which is his priority. And I thought I could, if I can encourage you in this, let me, let me tell you something. He's worthy of every bit of it. And you see that when Paul says, you guys, I'm not only ready to be bound, but to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he is worthy. Paul has seen a glimpse of his glory, and he says, man, I'll do whatever I've got to do to bring God glory. It's like I read that, and I hear it, and I'm like, yes, God, would you do that in me? Prepare me like that. Make me, make me have that resolve, you know? Um, his priority is not your comfort. <clears throat> it's his glory. And sometimes you have to wrestle with that. The world we live in today wants to prioritize your comfort <laughs> and your safety that's not how it works with God. So wrestle through that. That does not mean that we can just be idiots and, and put ourselves in danger. That's not how it works either, right? You see how we can go kind of both sides and extremes. Like, no, man, walk where God has you. Paul is just walking where God has him. And it just so happens to be leading to harm and his eventual death. Well, thankfully, not all of us are called to that, right? You guys live in, a, in, in the United States where things are still free, we can freely live as Christians. Praise God. There are places in the world where God puts a call on someone's life to follow after Jesus and to be a bold witness of the gospel, and that puts them in harm's way, themselves and their family. Praise the Lord. We don't live in that place, but there are those who do. So you guys maybe just come to terms with the fact that, man, sometimes God will call you to do things that are not safe, easy, comfortable, but he's glorified. And what's our job? Man, my job is to obey. That's what I do. I obey. So Lord, help me, right? That's a work of his spirit. Abide in Christ. And we'll obey as we ought, you know. And so there's that relationship. Enjoy him. Okay. Large crew traveling. This guy, Manasseh, this is in verse 16. This guy, Manasseh of Cyrene, or sorry, Cyprus, 
It says he was an early disciple. It's the Greek word archaeos. We kind of have the word archaic. It was that which was from the beginning. And so it's thought, even though he has a Greek name, he probably didn't travel with Jesus during Jesus' earthly ministry. But it's thought that this guy very likely was um, hanging out or had gotten saved during the time of Pentecost when the church was born. He was perhaps a Hellenistic Jew. And so he has a Greek name, but he had a Jewish faith, likely or possibly. Or he just could have gotten saved as some random guy. But he's been following Jesus for a long time. Um, th- those are the large group of people traveling down. Remember Paul's crew with Sopater and who was the other guys? Trophimus, Gaius, um, Aristarchus, Segundus, Timothy, Tychicus, and this guy Trophimus, which is going to get Paul in trouble here in a second. And then everybody from Caesarea, this group from Caesarea. Well, this guy, Manasin, he's going to be housing them. So he's probably a really wealthy guy who can just support, and he's using those giftings and his generosity to help the church take place there. But I want to point out really quickly the beauty of the community that Paul had. He's traveling with a group of people who are on fire for Jesus and are going to Jerusalem knowing full well things are going to get dirty. And they're aware of it, and they've reconciled it, and they've put it in their heart. Like, I recognize if we go here, there is the potential that we are going to be bound just like Paul's going to be bound. But they are like, you know what? Whatever the Lord has, and that's what they ended up praying. Whatever the Lord wills, that's what's up. We're going to Jerusalem, and we're following after Jesus. He's worthy of it all. Their lives are his. I'm not worried about my life anymore. My life is for him. I've been bought at a price. And so they recognize that. The assembling together, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, don't forsake gathering together. We need one another as Christians to edify, to encourage, and to exhort. Jesus is coming back. Things are going to get crazy prior to that. And so we got to be together, exhorting each other, encouraging one another. We get from one another accountability, meaning I can't just do whatever I want. I got a brother. I got a brother. I got my wife. Like they're saying, hey, what are you doing? Are you following after Christ? Are you obeying the move of God's spirit? I can become lazy. And so we've got people who can keep us accountable, who can encourage us when we're discouraged. Coming on Wednesday night, uh, or I was rolling on this road on Tuesday. I'm just going to be honest with you guys. And I'm like, and I'm just, it's this overwhelming feeling of like, what on earth am I even doing? I don't even know what I'm doing. Why am I here? Why am I in this position? You know, and it's like, blah, blah, blah. The enemy's attacking, doing all these things. And then Wednesday night comes, and it was so sweet to be able to worship together and to just sit, and, and I get to just sit and listen to the word, you know, and it's like, oh, it was so sweet. I'm like, Lord, you're so good that you would, you would mandate this. I need it. And I hope that you guys recognize the value of gathering together like this, that you can then be filled up and encouraged and inspired this morning, and then you can go get after it during your work week. And I hope you experience the love of Christ when you're here. We need that. Paul had it when he was there. <clears throat> um. Okay, I got a timeline up there. Bailey, can you throw that up there? It says Paul of the Paul of Tarsus. Oh, there it is. Thanks. I don't know. You can, you can, I don't know if you can see it. Anyway, just, just to give you an idea, this is Paul's timeline. Um, but I wanted to show you just really fast how much time has passed. You've got this Manasin of Cyprus. He was maybe born again when the church was born somewhere around 30 AD, and it it slides. You know, you think, I thought Jesus was 33, and like, I get it. There's just interesting timelines. Listen, this is just an ish, plus or minus three years or five years or something like that. We're getting, we know pretty well the time period we're in right here is around 57 to 58 AD, where Paul's here with this guy. And and I'm going to read you something next week that's going to be a lot of fun. It's like a little history thing. I cannot wait. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys are excited. But Manasin would have gotten born again perhaps during around 30, 31, 32. Whenever the church was born, he was likely born again then. And so he's that early disciple. Then you've got guys uh, like Paul. He was converted somewhere around 34 to 35 AD. So then you have guys like Trophimus, Aristarchus, Segundus, Timothy. They would have come to know the Lord during Paul's first, second, or third missionary journey. And that time period was around 47 to 56 AD. And so Manasseh would have been a guy who had been following Christ for 15 or so years prior to these guys. And they would have seen him as somebody they looked up to, who would have known things. He would have known scripture differently, right? Being 15 years their senior in that way. So there's a timeline of what goes on. It's just for your reference. Have some fun with it. In verses 18 through 25, Paul gets confronted by James concerning a certain issue. 
is they're like, Paul, this is what we're hearing. Now, Paul has been misrepresented, and I'm going to go through why he's been misrepresented. But they were zealous for the law, and there was a tension that Paul was holding. How much do I have zeal for the law versus how much do I preach grace? And there's going to be this tension with the Jewish church. Zealous for the law. And this is a com- uh, from Guzik commentary. I wanted to read it to you. It, I think it helps us understand it. Based on Romans chapter 14, which is a great section on what we would maybe call the law of love, on how we treat one another concerning different convictions that we have, not necessarily hard and fast sin, which the Bible states, because if you're in sin, then let me tell you, you're wrong. But these are convictions we might have concerning different things that are gray, if I can say it like that. Romans 14 just helps us understand we, we're gracious towards one another. I don't despise a person who does something that I think they shouldn't. I don't judge another person, right? So one person can't despise, one person can't judge. Okay, it seems that Paul didn't have a problem with Jewish Christians who wanted to continue to observe the old customs and the old laws. It seems actually he himself did so. He took a vow of Nazarite, of a Nazarene. And he did all that. That's in Acts chapter 18. And so Paul did that. He, he cut his hair off and he would have burned it as an, an offering to the Lord. <clears throat> Probably, you might remember, it seemed fine with Paul that he did this as long as, and there's, this is a very important point, as long as those things weren't thought of as something that would make you more righteous. It was just a way that the Jews... Jewish Christians worshiped God or expressed worship to him. If it was something for atonement, then it was wrong because it's already done. Jesus has already paid the price. And the covenant we now have with Jesus, with God through Jesus, is way better than the other covenant. Better promises, better mediator, better blood. It's the blood of Jesus. And so to go back and offer sacrifices for atonement, Nah, that's not going to work. Paul actually fought really hard against that. But to worship God in this way, it seems like there was some space created for that, where Paul recognized that you can continue to walk in the customs or your culture to a certain degree, and that's fine. There's something really important and beautiful about the gospel and that it allows room for that, that you can be in the Middle East, you can be in Africa or Central America, and guess what applies? The gospel applies there. And you can continue to live how you were living. Bear with me for a second. Because the gospel supersedes and goes beyond that. I don't need to move to Jerusalem and go into the temple to have a relationship with God anymore. It's torn from top to bottom. And Jesus actually alluded to it when he was talking to the woman at the well, where he said that there's coming a time you're not going to worship here or there. You're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And this is the time that they're seeing These things are no longer necessary in order for you to get righteous before God. What was Paul's message? You notice in verse 21 that they had been informed that Paul was saying, forsake Moses. Stop it. Don't circumcise. Now, Paul was being misrepresented. I'm going to go through what Paul's message was. First thing, you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's a simple message. Not by works. That's Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. You are saved by grace through faith. It'll go on. That man, Paul will say this, number two, man is not justified by the works of the law. Now that would have been news to a Jewish person. You are not justified by the works of the law. That's Galatians chapter 2, verse 6. And so if you continue to do these customs because you think you're being justified, Paul said, you're wrong. And you're taking it too far. That's not what God had intended. The law was to bring you to a certain spot. Okay, in fact, number three, the purpose of the law was to teach us, I'm summarizing, was to teach us that we need Jesus. As we're confronted with the truth of the law and the realization that I've broken the commandments of God, that I now am guilty as charged, a holy God, I'm a sinner, and I'm in trouble. So then I see the law, I'm confronted by it, and the whole point is that I'm recognizing that I need a savior. I need someone who did live righteously. Now, here's what's cool. Jesus perfectly fulfilled God's law, every aspect of it. And what we do as Christians is we 
hop inside of Jesus and we hide in him. That's, that's kind of the language that scripture uses. We hide ourselves in Christ. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. No longer is it necessary for me to eat that way or to offer this sacrifice. I don't need to because it has been fulfilled in Christ. And so now I have that freedom to wherever I am, I get to worship him because I have a righteousness that's not my own. Okay, so the point of the law was to show me that I need a savior. I'm confronted by that. Um, there, there are other things that the law is so beautiful and that it reveals the heart of God. I'm not going to go into all of that, but the law in the Old Testament is so important and so relevant for the church today. That's why we study it. Wednesday nights, we go through the, the Old Testament and study it in depth. Help us, help us understand. Okay, fourth thing. Righteousness comes not from adherence to the Mosaic law, but by faith in Jesus. Again, that would have been new, almost a restatement of what I've already said. You're not justified by the works of the law, and you are not made righteous by the works of the law. You are made righteous, and you are justified because of the work of Jesus on the cross. That's why you put your faith in him, and you hold fast to the gospel. You hold fast to Jesus. Concerning circumcision, here's what Paul says. It's a bit of a summary. It just doesn't matter. You need Jesus. That's what matters. He's like, I don't care if you're circumcised. I don't care if you're uncircumcised. I need you to know Jesus. That's what matters. And they had the whole thing, Acts chapter 16, they were fighting back and forth about, do I have to become a Jew and then I can be saved? And Paul's like, you got to be kidding me, no. Not a chance. You need Jesus. This morning, same is true, you need Jesus. He is the King of kings. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, we're promised that you will be saved. <clears throat> So that was Paul's message, misrepresented. Now an opportunity is given, Paul, to do what? Uh, to, well, let's take this out. James asks Paul to demonstrate he wasn't against the customs of Judaism, as has been told. Okay, so there's a potential that relationship has been severed with, between Paul and the Jewish people. Remember, Paul's Jewish. He loves his Jewish people. But they're now kind of like button heads. And so a uh, opportunities presented for Paul to make amends. Now, some people were going to look at this and say that Paul compromised and he shouldn't have compromised. And I'm totally open to that. I don't personally agree, but I'm totally open to how a person could see that and, and wonder, right? And so we're like interpreting scripture, trying to figure out what's going on. And I, I could totally see it. Paul was against the lie that adherence to the law made you more righteous. And so if you going to the temple and offering and doing this makes you think that you're better now, he says you're wrong. It's not how it works. When Jesus said it was finished, he meant it was finished. That when you are in Christ, your righteousness is, is done. It's there. It's, it's finished. Rest. That's why he's become our Sabbath. That's why in Jesus, we get to just enjoy a position of righteousness and justification and sanctification. You don't have to work for that position. You have it. It's from that position that now you get to go and do good works. You're not working to be saved. You're saved so you can work. And that's the beauty of it. And, and, and hey, that means you get to rest. Don't strive anymore. You think you're trying to please God by all your works. You're here this morning so you can please. Nah, you're missing it. He's pleased in Jesus. And when you hide yourself in Christ, you are now pleasing to him. It's an amazing thing, grace. It can be difficult to comprehend and understand because we live in a world that is like merit-based. And so if you do this, then I, I appreciate you and I like you more now or something, right? <clears throat> it's not how it works with God. Now, that's not to say that we can just go and live however we want. Remember, Paul says this in Scripture. Shall we sin so grace can abound? He says, come on, you guys. You're missing the whole point of grace. You have grace so you can live righteously now. Yes, this is good. Okay, we could talk all day about this, but I got to move on along. Okay, we've got a communion today. Um, he was against that. Paul had a chance to repair relationships. Romans chapter 12, verse 18, if it is possible. Okay. And as, and as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Paul has an opportunity, I believe, presented before him to where he can, as much as is possible for him, as much as depends on him, to live peaceably. He's trying to mend relationships. So he's going to go and offer this. Um, there, there is a point, though, where I have to choose that I'm not going to just go along with the customs of the world, right? There has to come a point in time where they, they, they conflict one another. They conflict with one another. 
there's an important distinction. <clears throat> it is okay to maintain some cultural customs so long as they don't come in conflict with the truth of Scripture and the truth of the gospel. And, and you have to use discernment knowing when that line has been reached. Some of you might have different convictions. That's fine. But once it becomes something that interferes with the gospel, we've got problems. And that's what Paul's trying to articulate. Here, we've got to understand that there are certain laws and customs within Judaism that weren't for atonement, that wasn't a way of worshiping God, and, and that's where Paul's going at right now. <clears throat> Paul did say, and this is a scripture that is worth studying and wrestling through, to the Jews I became a Jew that I might win the more. And to the Gentiles, guess what? He became a Gentile. Why though? What's the point? Not so he can keep the peace, but it's so he can win the more. And so is he living a compromised, watered-down life? The answer is no. He's living a life of discernment, obeying the move of the Spirit, knowing how to navigate certain sections. But let me tell you this. There absolutely came a time where Paul did stand up against what was going on. In Galatians, it's talked about where he confronted Peter and let him have it. He says, you're playing the hypocrite, Peter. How dare you treat the Gentiles like this? Acting like if you, if you eat this food, then you're not good enough, like whatever else it is. Like, this is messed up. So he confronted, there was a line eventually where he couldn't cross it. He says, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to confront that. So we need discernment as we walk with God. That's really a, the, kind of the main point of the day. Consider this, as you walk with the Lord, you, you must be led by the Spirit. The convictions that you have, let the Spirit navigate. Let the Spirit lead you. Let God's Word be what, what guides you in, through these things. Um, but it's important to note, not all sacrifices in the Jewish law were for atonement. What Paul's getting ready to do is, is an act of worship and consecration. Um, he had already done this. We now have trouble. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to zoom through this pretty quick. Um, in verses 26 through 36, 10 verses. Let me read it, make some commentary, and then we'll uh, begin doing communion, okay? So look at verse 26. Paul took the men the next day, having, purified with, having been purified with them, entered the temple and announced the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Again, it's an offering of consecration. They have finished their vow. If you want, Bailey, throw that one picture up of the temple, the real big one. Yeah, that one. It's like a model just so you can see. This, this is where all this would have been taking place um, in, in the inner kind of most part of the temple complex. When the seven days were ended, this is verse 27, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, they stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. All of a sudden, these prophecies are coming true. And all that Paul had been anticipating, it actually started happening right here. <clears throat> they laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This, man, this is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, against the Israelites. The law... And this place, and furthermore, he brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Luke points out they had previously seen Trophimus, remember him? The Ephesian with Paul in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. They just said, you know what, I bet Paul probably did this. All the city was disturbed. The people ran together, seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. And you can see there's these beautiful bronze Corinthian door things that are really neat and beautiful. Uh, they would have closed those, and Paul was out of there. As they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison, and all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander the sol and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. How long had they been beating him? Okay, go to the next picture where it kind of zooms in, and you can see there's this fortress on the top part where it says Antonia. Um, that was a Roman fortress that they literally put right on the wall of the Jewish temple just so the Jews knew Rome is looking. I mean, that was the point of it is like, I just want you to know, Jews, that we see what you're doing, and we are over you kind of a thing. So that, they were up there, and they would have gone down and been running around. I just want you to anticipate how long that would have taken for the commander to go from there, get all of his troops together, and then roll in there. Um, that's how long Paul had gotten beaten. A minute, two minutes, three minutes, right? I don't know how long you've ever been beaten before, but uh, that'd be a long time to get beat. So just imagine, this is what's happening. The commander came near, took Paul, and commanded him to be bound with two chains, and asked who he was and what he had done. And some people said this, some people said the other thing. 
He could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult. He commanded him to be taken back into the barracks. Verse 35. When he had reached the stairs, he had to be carried by soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out away with him. They want him to die. This is a scary situation. This is the same situation where like Stephen died. Jesus was crucified. He's in this situation now. All these prophecies and all the anticipation. Finally, he's there. He's bleeding. He's been beaten. He's hurting. He's gotten these shots. Like he's hurt right now. Um, why? <laughs> a total misunderstanding. Uh, you can barely see it, but right over there by the Temple Mount, if you were to look left, you're going to see a line that goes down uh, right next to the temple. And there, that was a middle wall where Gentiles weren't allowed to go and cross that. In fact, it was so serious for the Jews that a Gentile would not cross that line that the Romans did actually allow the Jews to kill anyone who went in beyond that. And so it was a serious thing. I wish we had some more time. But for now, I'll just end it with this. There is something incredible that has happened. Two different things have been torn down. The first one that's important for you to realize is that the curtain that separated the holies from the holiest of all had been torn top to bottom when Jesus was crucified. And it's this picture that relationship with God is now made possible when you put your faith in Jesus. Not by works of righteousness, but by faith in Jesus. You now have access to the Father. Sin which once kept you away, Jesus has taken that upon himself, and you now have relationship with the Father. We're going to celebrate it with communion here in a second, if I can just be quiet. The second thing that's important is in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 14, I think, maybe 11, doesn't matter. Anyway, um, he says that for he himself has become our peace, and he's broken down the middle wall of separation. And that is a wall that literally is like there in the temple. Jesus broke that wall down. Gentiles can now cross in and have relationship with the Father, but also with Jews. And, and he's made two people one in Christ. And it's the unity that you get with the gospel. And so like we as people, uh, all those like things that separate us or used to, well, in Jesus, they don't. And we have incredible unity now because of what's happened. And like there literally was a wall that separated Jew and Gentile from worshiping. But in Jesus, it's irrelevant now. He's broken it down. We get to have fellowship with people. We get to enjoy like today, right now, this things that might have previously caused you caused division, man, the Lord has fixed it all. And we have unity and fellowship and, and closeness, and we love one another. It's a really special thing that God has done, and, and it prevents things like this from happening, what Jesus has done. I want to encourage you that Jesus has become our peace. Jesus has become our rest. You know these things, but I think for some of us to wrestle through and, and maybe identify ways we're working or striving and not resting. And I want to encourage you guys, rest in the love, rest in the grace of God and the finished work of the cross that he's done. We're going to celebrate it now, what Jesus has done. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll take communion. But Lord, we ask for a fresh understanding of the grace and the mercy that you have shown us in providing a sacrifice yourself that you came, Jesus, and you gave your life on our behalf. And that sin and uh, lack of righteousness that we had in you, uh, you've made us right. And we just want to be reminded of it, a fresh understanding of it, even this morning, that we would see it and we would rejoice and say thank you for what you have done. You have done a work and we remember it this morning and ask that you would bless this time um, where we just pause and think on you. We praise you. Thank you for the unity we have. Thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you for the example of Paul. Seeing you is so worth every bit of hardship, every bit of difficulty that might come our way. Jesus, it's worth it if you're exalted. And so we would even ask this morning that you would help us with that, that you would make us bold witnesses and that you would stir up this church with the gifts of the Spirit and that you would bring evangelists, 
people who are excited and ready to go and share the gospel, would you help us as a church to do the work of an evangelist and take the gospel to a lost and dying world? We look to you for that, Lord, as we abide in you. We trust that that heart will be impressed upon us. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And so, Lord, we're praying that you'd send laborers out for your glory, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this time. Bless it, we ask in your name. Amen. The rhythms of your grace, your fragrance is intoxicating in a secret place. Cause your love is extravagant. Spread wide in the the cover sin no greater represents his blood, right, that was shed for our salvation, and the bread represents his body that was broken for our redemption, right, and he's the one that broke down that middle wall of separation that divided people um, from each other, but also from, from him, right, and that, and that he came, and he died for us. Um, in Matthew 26, it says this, 
But as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sins. And so that we can just, even now, during this time, communion is a great time just to reflect on your own personal relationship with Jesus. Just you and him, right now. If there's things you need to talk to him about, maybe confess, ask for forgiveness, it's a great time to do that. It's also a great time to give thanks, to give him, say, thank you, Jesus, for, for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your extravagant grace and love. And then it's also a reminder that he did not just die, and that was the end of the story. He rose again three days later, conquering sin and death. And then we can go out and we can share that love with others. Let's pray for the bread and the juice together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you willingly offered your life for ours. You lived a perfect, sinless life that I know I and we as people cannot live. And Lord, you did so with amazing love and grace. Uh, for the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross, despising the shame, and you've sat down at the right hand on the throne on high in heaven. So Lord, we just thank you for all that you've done for us, and we just uh, partake together as your bride in Jesus' name. Amen. You may partake. If you please stand for this last song, and we will close.
Christ is Father, we thank you that we can come to the altar this morning, Lord, and that altar is not one of bronze, Lord, where we make sacrifices anymore, Lord. We come right to your throne, Lord, you've made your most holy place accessible to us, Lord. Lord, you have made us your friends, Lord, and we find intimate communion with you now. Lord, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like redemption, Lord, and mercy. Lord, your perfect love that we can come into your presence, Lord, and just be with you. Lord, you have forgotten all of our sin. Lord, it's been cast into the sea. It's like it never existed if we are found in Christ, Lord. So we come to you, Jesus. We rest in you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for what you've done for us give you all the glory. Do with us as you will, Lord. Have your way in us as we go. Be with us. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Have a good week, everybody. Bless.
us with strength, take our fear, grant us wisdom in this moment, Jesus.
Show me your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me to walk in your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Show me your ways, 
you 
lifted up. We give glory to your holy name. We lift it up. We lift it up. We give glory to your holy name.
Let your glory Open up service, and so if you wouldn't mind with me, please stand for the reading of some scripture and for the first few songs. So blessed and thankful that the sun is out and it's no more doom and gloom. But today we're going to be reading Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. It says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take my refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Lord, we're so thankful that even though life happens, circumstances, trials come our way, 
that you are God and you are with us through every moment and second that we face those things, Lord. And so we ask and pray that you fill this place with your spirit and that no matter what happens or what takes place, Lord, that there would be a song in our mouth, Lord, constantly to lift you up and that we could have the joy of the Lord be before us constantly. And so, Lord, thank you for who you are, what you've done. We ask and pray for this time, Lord, be with Jordan, be with the worship team, and let's lift up your name. And so we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Remember those walls. Remember those walls that we caught sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. Those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God This is our God This is who he is He loves us This is our God This is what he does He saves us He pulled the cross Beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear, remember that fear that took our breath away. Faith so weak that we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every whisper. Those altars in the wilderness that tell the story of his faithfulness. Never once did he fail, and he never will. Cause this is our God, this is who he is, he loves us. This is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He pulled the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Who rescued, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Jesus pulled, who pulled me out of that pit, he did. He did, who paid for all of our sin, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but Jesus, who rescued me from that grave, Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise, nobody but hell. This is our God, this is who He is, He loves us. Oh, this is our God, this is what He does, He saves us. He pulled the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. He pulled the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Mm, this is our God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You are here, moving in. Thank you. 
promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here touching every you I worship you you are here healing every heart I worship you I worship you you are here turning lives around I worship you oh I worship you to see that you are working all around us, Lord. Lord, like Elijah prayed to open his servant's eyes, Lord, that we would see the battle that's before us, Lord. It's being waged for the hearts of people. It's being waged against us, Lord, as we seek to just follow you, Lord. Lord, help us. Do your will in us, Lord. You can have a seat if you'd like to as we continue to worship. You can stand if you feel comfortable. You fold me with 
with your hands known and loved by you before I took a breath when I doubted Lord remind me I'm wonderfully made you're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay you make all things you make all things work together for my future and for my good. You make all things work together for your glory and for. There's a healing light, there's a healing light Just beyond the clouds, though I fall through fire I see clearly now, I know nothing has been wasted No failure or mistake, you're an artist and a potter I'm the canvas and the clay Cause you make all things work together For my future and for my good You make all things work together for your glory I doubt it. When I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. I know nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. But when I doubt it, Remind me how wonderfully made You're an artist and a potter On the canvas and the clay And I know nothing has been wasted No failures or mistakes You're an artist and a potter On the canvas and the clay together for my future and for my good you make all things work together for your glory and for your name Lord so when I doubt it, Lord, remind me I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. And no, nothing has been wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. There's no place I'd rather be, no place I'd rather be, no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be, there's no place I'd rather be, there's no place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. 
to set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. To set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Yeah, one more of you, Lord. Come have your way, God. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. But here in your love, here in your love, there's no place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be There's no place I'd rather be Than here in your love, here in your love So set a fire down in my soul That I can't contain, that I can't control I want more of you, God I want more of you, God So set a fire down in my soul I can't contain, that I can't I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Oh, yes, I want more of you, Lord. Less of me, Lord. There's no place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I'd rather be. There's no place I'd rather be. No place I'd rather be than here in your love, here in your love. Mm. Lord, I find life in your presence. Lord, we were made to worship you. We are the canvas and the clay, Lord. We were made to be made something beautiful by you. So Lord, take our offerings, Lord. Take our broken pieces, Lord. Lord, we set them before you. We come into your presence, Lord to the Holy of Holies, Lord, where, Lord, we would never be able to be unless it was for you, Jesus. That you take all these things, Lord, that were worthless, Lord, and you make them something beautiful. Lord, we can come and sit at your feet before your throne, Lord. We ask that you'd have your way with us, have your way in our hearts, Lord. The only thing worthy living for, Lord. So turn our eyes towards you, Lord. Make us a generation that would seek your face. God, we ask. Have your way in this place, Lord. Have your word go forth um, by your spirit, Lord. May it rest on good soil, Lord. And we just thank you. We love you. We thank you for what you've done, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, let's greet one another this morning.
While you're taking your seats, if you would be so kind as to welcome a real-life Bible college student, Yoni. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Oh, wow, lively. That's sweet. My name is Yoni. I'm a second-year Bible college student here on campus. And um, we got something really exciting coming up in April. If you guys remember, we have a mission trip, also what we call the practicum trip. Coming up, we have a team. Some people are going to be going to Ecuador. Some people are going to be going to other local places. But we got to do some preparing to get there. So um, let's just talk about that real quick. Um, we're going to be going to Ecuador um, and some other places possibly, and we've just been praying about it for a long time. But this is finally the time that we as Bible college students get to really, in a really pretty big way, step out and um, live out the faith that we've been growing in over the last year or two. It's a really big deal, and we're gonna go and serve local communities in various different ways, and I'm, we're just really excited for that what God's going to do. And you guys can be, be a part of that. And so the way you guys can be a part of that is be praying for us. Please, be, please, please do not be afraid to be praying really big prayers. God hears you and pray it in faith because he will answer them. And uh, really what we're asking for is one prayer. And that's the first and foremost and the biggest thing that we're asking for because without prayer, nothing is possible. And we will not be going in the power of God and we need to be going in the power of God. The second thing we're asking for, and we're, I'm just explaining, is this idea of a fundraiser. One of our fundraisers is something called Rent a Student, which is where if you have a different needs, different kinds of needs, if you need help moving, if you need help gardening, if you need help around, or you know anybody else who is needing help around their communities, um, the Bible College is here and available on Mondays, um, Monday mornings until one o'clock to be able to help you guys with those needs. All we're asking for is a donation um, that you can give cheerfully out of your heart. As Chuck used to say, um, God loves a cheerful giver. And so um, you would really be investing in us and supporting what we're doing um, and the communities that we're gonna be serving here in April in a couple months. And so it would really mean a lot to us if you guys could pray for us and if you know anybody or you yourself have any needs, um, please reach out to Paul Lang. And uh, on the cards over here, we got um, the information that you're going to need to um, to get all that organized with us. So thank you, guys. I really appreciate you listening to me. You guys might notice that like today's service is brought to you by the Bible College. Um, so we have rent a student, and then we have parents' night out, February 22nd. Uh, if you want to bring your kids and drop them off, they'll be taken care of, loved, and all that. And then you can go out and have like a, like a Valentine's Day type of a thing. It's kind of around that time. I should probably know when Valentine's Day is, but I'll figure it out. Um, but a really sweet way of hanging out uh, and supporting your Bible college. But, and then additionally... This morning, well, okay, no, this afternoon at about 12.45, or really kind of whenever I shut up and get out of the way, we're having a pancake lunch thing as a fundraiser for the Bible College as well. And we'd love for you guys to join us. Uh, if you have lunch plans, cancel them, and then come and hang out with us and uh, eat some pancakes, hang out, fellowship, support the Bible College would be sweet. We'd appreciate that. Um, that'll just be right after service in the cafeteria um, March 3rd, your bulletin says that, is Pizza with Pastors. We invite you to come. If you are new or newer to the fellowship or you just like pizza, you can come hang out with us. You just got to let us know that you're coming. That way we can have the right amount of food for everybody. Basically, it's a time where we're just going to share a little bit about who we are as a Horizon 
slash Calvary Chapel Church, where we come from, why we're here, what we're doing, things of that nature. And you get a chance to ask some questions and so on um, and eat pizza. And then afterwards, uh, we'll break off into little groups and a different pastor will go and you get to know certain, certain people and we'll travel campus. And so we've got about 100 acres of campus here that we like to just show you and you guys have access to it as, a, as people here who come to the church. But we just wanna, want you to see it and get a feel for what the Lord's doing here and the various ministries that take place. Um, so there's this thing. It's called a bulletin. <clears throat> it's a piece of paper that has information on it that's relevant to this church. And I would encourage you to check it out because there's a lot in here that is really important, but I just can't highlight everything. There is men's breakfast, though, this coming Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, but February 11th, the Sunday after the men's breakfast we're excited about, is a baptism service. We've got several people who are wanting to get baptized. And if you're out there and you haven't, then come on, let's do this. Or if you are used by God and you're hanging out with people this week and they get saved, let's, let's baptize them, okay? So that is February 11th. If you know anybody or you have that within your own heart, you're stirred up, then would you contact myself or call the front office and let us know? We'll follow up with you and, uh, and walk you through what that'll look like. It's as simple as, are you born again? Right on, and then we dunk you. It's, just, it's not that much harder than that. So also, during second service, there's a new Sunday session about church planning. I want to invite you to come be a part of that and see what the Lord's doing if your heart's stirred up. We're in Acts chapter 21. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. And someone will pass one out to you. <clears throat> We've made it all the way here. We're going to start in verse 15. We're going to go all the way to 36. As you guys know, some sections we'll pause and really dive into. And then uh, other sections we'll, we'll roll through pretty quickly. But before we do, let's set this time aside. And, let's, and, then, oh, and then we get to hang out in the Word. Let, let's pray. Jesus, have your way. We're your church. We've come here to worship you. We've set this time aside for you. Um, we're not here to be cute, or to have fun, although I hope we do a little, but we just want you. It's as simple as that. We're, we're needy, Lord. We need you, a, a work of your Holy Spirit in our own lives, moving us, encouraging us. And so we just pause and say, here we are, Lord. Fill this place up. Help us to understand your word. We submit to it and the authority of it, the truth of it. Confront us, convict us as you see fit. Holy Spirit, teach us. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. As you guys know, who've been traveling along with us, Paul is making his way to Jerusalem. And it's not gonna be an exciting trip. It's gonna be a hard trip, and you guys know why. He said in verse 13, just before, uh, this was all last week, he says, I'm not ready he says, for I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, a lot has led to that statement. A lot of life has been lived, and um, we're, we're picking up right where Paul's like, I don't even care, right? This is similar to what we saw in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, as you know. Uh, uh, Jay, if you don't mind, throw that graphic up that people probably can't read, but um, if you can see it, I want you to see where we are in the book of Acts. That yellow highlighter that I made is where we are, and there's some dates. That's going to come into play later, but you'll notice we're in a really important transition period where we're going from, and the, the rest of our conversation here in the book of Acts on is going to be Paul as a prisoner. And it changes where God has in his sovereignty and his beauty has, has spread the gospel through the known like kind of European area. It wasn't then, but, but now we understand it as, as Europe, um, Turkey, Greece, Italy, places like that. The gospel has gone, and now God's going to do a new work in and through Paul, and we're following that journey. And so this is where it lands us. The church had expanded, but now we see that Paul's going to be on trial. And God is going to be faithful to complete his promise in Paul's life that he's going to stand before kings. And he's going to stand before the nation of Israel. 
and he's going to stand before the Gentiles all for the point of preaching Jesus. And we're going to watch it unfold. Today we get to see an unfortunate event take place, um, but it's one that Paul had been anticipating for quite some time. So I'm going to read 15 to 25, comment here and there. We'll reset back. You guys know the drill. So let's look. This is Acts chapter 21, verse 15. After those days, we packed and went to Jerusalem. Remember, they're in Caesarea. So they're going to head south now to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain, the guy's name is Manasin of Cyprus, an early disciple, with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail all the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. It's worth pausing and noting that the language that Luke is using is like every detail. We don't get that. We didn't have every detail in the book of Acts. We have highlights of things that have happened in, in, um, in Paul's life primarily. And then the beginning of Acts was Peter uh, primarily, but here we re we're reading that when when Luke was was listening to all that was going on, remember, because Luke wrote the book of Acts, so he's listening to these things take place, and he's taking notes. He's a physician. He's a smart dude. <clears throat> he takes note that Paul just shared everything, all the things that had taken place in Philippi and Colossae and Ephesus and uh, and um in Corinth and Athens and Berea, all the places that Paul had gone, and all the things that had taken place. This is what they're talking about. They're sharing it with the, the Jews there that are in Jerusalem, those who are following Christ, James being the leader. And that's not James the apostle, that's James the brother of Jesus. James the apostle had been uh, martyred already. And so as he shares these details, notice what he's sharing and notice how Luke writes this out. This is so important and so sweet. It's what God had done. It's not what Paul did. It's what God had done. Now he uses us though, doesn't he? And it's an important thing to remember. I think it keeps us humble in recalling the fact that this is uh, something that only God can do. Any kind of ministry, any kind of stuff that we try to walk out, man, it's the Lord who does it. If you think different, listen, um, that's just foolish, I suppose. When I submit myself to the realization <laughs> that it's God who works in me both to will and to do for his good pleasure, it, it, it offers you a place of rest knowing that he's the one who's going to take care of this, that he's the one who's going to do the ministry. It's not up to you. What does he want from us? Well, if you'll notice, uh, through his ministry, we just open ourselves up. God, here I am. I'm available to you. I'm enjoying you. And as you make yourself available to him and as you enjoy him, you know what he does? He fills your heart. He moves you. That's where it's like his spirit doing the work in and through you. God had done the ministry. God had done the work, and Paul just gets to sit back and say, look what God has done. When they heard, this is in verse 20, this is the, like James and the Jewish leaders. When they heard it, they glorified the Lord. That means they praised him. They heard all that had happened, and they were thinking, this is incredible. All these people getting saved. All the, the work that God's doing in, this, in these Gentile lands the, the Jewish believers in Christ there were like, this is incredible. And they were glorifying the Lord. Like they were praising God. They were probably saying that, like praise God, right? When Paul would say a certain thing or, or whatever would happen, they would share this. Remember, he's got a full crew that's with him. Timothy's with him. Trophimus, uh, Aristarchus, Segundus, Gaius, different guys are with him. And they're all attesting to these things and sharing. Big old party happening. And they're glorifying the Lord. That's important. Keep that in mind. As they said to him... Now, now, now James and the people are going to say, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed. And so they're like, we hear that God's doing some crazy work out and wherever you've been. But let me tell you, Paul, God's been working here in Jerusalem. There's a bunch of Jews who are following Christ now. And they're zealous for the law. That's an interesting statement. We're going to talk about it later. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not circumcise their children nor walk according to their customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who've taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they 
May, so they may shave their heads and that they may all know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you're, you, you yourself are also walking orderly and keeping the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. All of that was taking place in Acts chapter 16. You might remember it. Reset back to 15. <clears throat> I want you to imagine the anticipation that Paul had in going to Jerusalem and why that matters. And it's an interesting thought. As I was studying through this, consider in Acts chapter 18, Paul had said that there's come in, like, I've got to get to Jerusalem. He had to keep a feast in Jerusalem. And so all the way back then he knew for months, Paul, Paul has been anticipating this particular event. And we're watching it unfold before our very eyes this morning. In Acts 19, it says that he purposed in his spirit, man, I got to go to Jerusalem. And then after Jerusalem, I'm going to go to Rome. That's kind of what he was sensing, right? As he's hanging out with the Lord, nothing fancy. He just has this thought, thought like, man, I'm supposed to probably go to these places, you know? He was being led by the Lord is what we've observed. In Acts chapter 20, he says, he's like, listen, I don't know what's going to happen other than in every city that I go to, the Holy Spirit testifies that everywhere I go in Jerusalem, that chains and tribulations await me. That's what he said in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. Then he says in 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may complete the race and the ministry that God has given me to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He's like, I don't even care. All that's in front of me is, is pain and misery. He's like, but Lord Jesus is worth every bit of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Acts chapter 21, this is recent history, last week, um, they, had, they had testified through the Spirit, don't go to Jerusalem. You're going to get hurt. Don't do it. And then in 21, verse 12, they pleaded with him, don't go. Do you remember Agabus came and took Paul's belt, bound his hands and said, whoever's belt this is, he's going to be bound when he goes to Jerusalem. And that's the occasion then where Paul would say, what are you guys crying for? Don't you know that I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die, right? So we read that at the very beginning. But it's worth pointing out that so much of what we've been watching is leading to this very point. And now Paul is walking to Jerusalem and I cannot help but think that he's sitting here thinking, when's it going to happen? Am I going to get arrested the moment I step foot in Jerusalem? Will it be a day afterwards, two days? What about when I go to the temple and hang out there? Are they going to take me captive then? When am I going to be bound? When am I going to be beat? I can't imagine walking into it. I was sharing on last service that you guys remember those, that there's times of anticipation that cause really great anxiety. When you know that there's going to be a counseling meeting and it's going to be confrontational and you're just like, oh, I'm ready to get this over with. Let's just go, right? And you're, there's an anxiety about it. I remember growing up, those horrible words you'd hear your mom say when it was, you wait till your dad gets home. And so that I got to wait all day and my dad worked like 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. And so it's like I had to literally wait all day and I earned every bit of what came my way. I can promise you that. My parents are here. You can ask them today. But just the waiting and anticipating, knowing that I've got something ahead of me that I'm not particularly looking forward to. <laughs> something I've earned. So it's really different than what Paul's experiencing here, but something I personally earned. Um, and so you're anticipating that and you're terrified. I don't know what it was like for Paul. He seemed to have some serious resolve in his heart. Whatever comes his way, he's following Jesus. But I have to point out, you guys, just for a second, that God's priority is not your safety and your comfort, okay? Now, we have to wrestle with that sometimes. Does he care about you? And the answer is yes. And so this is where that wrestle comes in. But he's done something so much greater than keep you safe. He has saved you from separation from God. That's, that's what's up. Your life, you guys, just, just so we're clear, is to be lived for him. I know you know that. You guys are so cool. But it is to be lived for him. And as we observe this path that Paul takes, I, I want to make sure that we, I don't know, like deal with maybe some of that difficult theology that uh, God might lead us to do stuff that puts us in harm's way. And we live in a world that, like, I don't know, like, champions safety, and, and for good reason. Like, I'm, because it's important to also say that it, you can't be an idiot, right? And you don't invite pain upon yourself. You don't invite these types of things. That's stupid, just so you know. Paul didn't invite this stuff upon him. Here's what he did. 
He just said, God, I'm going to follow you no matter what. And the reality is that sometimes God's, God leads you to do things that are difficult. Un- well, golly, they're, they're almost always difficult and uncomfortable. That's why it's hard. And so, yeah, like, um, it is difficult to, to reconcile sometimes. Doesn't he love me? Why would he allow Paul to go through such a difficult and awful trial? And those are like things you wrestle with. Encourage you guys to wrestle with it. That yes, his love is so deep, so incredible, and so anchored in the history of the cross that he, he can allow even these things to take place. And I don't have to question his love for me. But it's coming to terms with like the reason we exist, and it's to bring him glory. And I'd like to encourage you once again, if you'll allow me, man, that he's worthy of it. That he's worthy of it. Every single bit of it that your life, like we get to follow Jesus now. And because of the work of the cross, um, he's done this beautiful thing and he's set us apart. And I get to live for him. Okay, we we gotta still keep reading, sorry. There's just a lot of good here, right? Um, He's traveling, there's the anticipation. Um, This guy, Manasin, a quick fun little fact, You'll notice it says that he was an early disciple. The Greek word there is archaeos, which where we get the idea of um, archaic. And so it's like that which is from the beginning. This Manasin guy is likely a Hellenistic Jew who got saved during Pentecost, perhaps. It's unlikely that he would have followed Jesus during his early ministry because he was Greek. There were some who inquired of Jesus then. For whatever reason, though, Luke makes mention that he's like a really old disciple. He's been with and following Jesus for a long time. And he's probably a wealthy dude because you've got all of Paul's crew that he's rolling with. Plus you have the disciples from Caesarea going down and they're all staying in this guy's house. This would have been a big deal back then. It's a beautiful picture of God using different people who have the gift of generosity to to help the church, right? And so we see that they're staying with this guy, Manasin, um, he has this opportunity to enjoy the fellowship of the apostles. It's worth noting again that when these guys are together, that they have this really sweet fellowship with one another. It's like this, uh, it's, it's like a rolling church from Caesarea down to Jerusalem. And imagine the kind of uh, fellowship these guys have as they're sharing stories, walking to Jerusalem, knowing what's coming. Change and tribulation specifically for Paul, but I can't imagine that the other guys that are with them think that they're going to just get off free. <clears throat> they might experience the difficulties that Paul's going to experience. And, and several of these guys, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think it was Aristarchus is going to be put in prison with Paul himself. And so these guys don't get off for free. Like they're going to have trouble. So they're walking and talking, fellowshipping. That kind of camaraderie and that kind of community that we have as a church is so important in terms of accountability, encouragement, the kind of love that we have for one another to spur each other and inspire us to continue to follow Jesus. Because last I checked, it gets hard as the world just grinds and grinds against you. And it's like, I need help. Um, there's Hebrews 10, 25, don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves, which is the habit of some, but gather together, exhort one another so much more as you see the day approaching. Being together is important, and you just see the importance of community as they're rolling down <clears throat> to be encouraged. We need that kind of encouragement. We get down. I was rolling here to work on Tuesday, And I'm coming down this stretch of road, and I seriously am sitting here thinking, what on earth am I doing? Like these thoughts are flooding my mind. What on earth am I even doing? Why am I doing what I'm doing? What are you thinking, God, to have me even be in this place that I'm in, right? And so it was this discouragement from the enemy. It happens, right? We all experience it. And then you know what? Wednesday came. And I was reminded again of the beauty of gathering together and coming and worshiping uh, and the rest that you find there and then sitting underneath the teaching of God's word. Wednesday night, I get to just sit and enjoy the teaching of God's word. And I'm telling you, it combats the discouragement of the enemy to hold you down. 
Um, to be able to come and be filled up with other believers and prayed for and encouraged, like it means a lot. That's, I know that's why we're here this morning. We are not particularly fancy. There's nothing that would draw you here other than I hope that there's a love that you experience. I hope that you experience teaching from God's word that you would be encouraged and moved to go follow after Jesus. We need it. We see this beautiful picture of what's happening here. This Benason guy. Oh, hey, throw up that other. Bailey, can you put that one uh, other uh, timeline on there real fast? That you, you probably can't even read it. But the church was born somewhere around 30-ish AD. It's all ishes, so bear with me for those of you who are history nuts. Like, I'm just giving you ishes, okay? 30-ish is when the church was born. That was when Pentecost would happen. Maybe somewhere around then is when this Manasin guy would have been born. Sorry, born again. Paul then was saved or converted somewhere around 34 to 35 AD. But then those guys who are with Paul, the crew that he's rolling with, they would have been products of Paul's ministry and evangelism during his first, second, and third missionary journeys. That took place around 47 to 56 AD. So Manasin's like 15 years old in the Lord. He's been following Christ longer than Paul has, likely. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of context as far as the timeline goes, there it is. Have fun. Enjoy it. When we get to verse 18, James confronts Paul on some really interesting subject matter. He's like, we got a bunch of Jew Jews who are zealous for the law, but they're all hearing that you're telling everybody to forsake the law of Moses. Zealous for the law. I got this from Guzik Commentary. Check it out for just a moment. Romans chapter 14, in particular, is a really uh, important chapter as it relates to what we would maybe call the law of love. Where how do we live among one another when we have different convictions? Things that there's things that the Bible describes as sin and like, and that's obvious. And if you're living in sin, then you get confronted and you need to deal, deal with it and you repent, and you, whatever. But then there are things that are just gray area where you have a particular conviction about whatever it might be. How do we live with each other? Is kind of what Romans 14 deals with. It seems that Paul, I'm quoting David Guzik, it seems that Paul didn't have a problem with Jewish Christians who wanted to continue to observe old customs and laws. It seems that he himself did so sometimes, such as when he took and fulfilled a vow of consecration, likely the Nazarite vow. That was in Acts chapter 18. Paul seemed fine with this, but listen, it's so long as they didn't think it made them more right before God. And that's like kind of, the important part, that you can walk these things out and continue in the customs that you had as a Jewish person. This is a beautiful thing that God allows, and, and, and the power of the gospel and the beauty of what we have in the grace of God is seen right here, that you can maintain to a point who you are in your national identity, who you are as a people group, whatever it might be, you can continue in that. It's different than what it was back before uh, we have Jesus. You worshiped God in one location, in one place, and that was it. In fact, you could only meet with God one point in time in the year, where one person, once a year, went to one place and offered sacrifices of atonement for the whole nation. Jesus talked about this with the woman at the well when he explained to her, he said, lady, listen, there's coming a time and we're not going to worship on this mountain or the one back there in Jerusalem, but we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And this is the realization of that. And so powerful is the gospel and so incredible is the work of the cross that you can be anywhere in Africa, Central America, United States, wherever it might be, Europe, and you can know him and experience a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Paul is, is walking through this where you can still walk in your Jewish customs and follow Jesus. How cool is that? We, we have a problem, though. When there's a conflict and you think now because you're doing these things, you're made more righteous because of it. And that's where we're going to find contention. And that's where Paul would, was going to get in trouble. In verse 21, man, we hear that you are saying all these things to forsake the law of Moses and so on. Paul was completely misrepresented. 
I want to look at what his message was. It might be interesting to you. Here is Paul's message. The first thing, you are saved by grace through faith alone, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. Now, this is going to come in direct opposition of what they had previously known as Jews. But he's telling them, you are saved by grace through faith. There is nothing that you can do to add to the work of the cross. There is no perfect morality in order to gain what Christ has already given you. You're hiding yourself in him. The next thing that Paul would say is that man is not justified by the works of the law. That's Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. You are sold into sin. Like that's when you're born, that's where you're at. You've been separated from God. And apart from the work of the cross, you're lost. Nothing that you can do. How good do you have to be in order to make it to heaven? Let me tell you, it's a secret, but I'm going to let it out. Perfect. How on earth do you figure that one out? That's the beauty of what Christ has done. You are not justified by the works of law. Jesus' perfect life becomes yours. So you got to wrestle with this. This is what scripture teaches us. And this is why the gospel is so incredible. It's like, you, th that's too good to be true. And it's like, you're right, except it's true. But it is too good. You have this incredible gift, the righteousness of Jesus. And so even though I walk and sin and struggle and battle, but I hide myself in Jesus, I put my trust in him. Here's the thing. God sees me like he sees Jesus. Righteous and justified and sanctified. That's how God sees me. We're going to celebrate communion as soon as I'm done here. We get to remember this work of the cross. Like, that's why we have an incredible message. That's why Paul would say, I don't care what you do to me. This message is worth everything. That a person would know that God has taken care of it. You no longer have to be guilty for the things you've done. You no longer have to live in shame. You no longer have to strive and try to be good enough. You'll never be good enough. Rest in the finished work of Jesus. Remember the veil was torn from top to bottom? And when Jesus said, it is finished, he meant it. It's finished. Rest. Put your faith in him. Trust him. His righteousness is yours. How cool is that? And he took on our sin, man. Okay, the purpose of the law, that's the third thing, sorry. Purpose of the law was to teach us that we need Jesus. I'm paraphrasing, but why was the law given? You look at the law, you think, man, I've blown it. I have sinned against the holy God. I've rebelled against his desires and his commands. What do I do? How do I fix the fact that I have broken this relationship? I can't do it. Well, that's where Jesus comes in. The law shows us or teaches us, I need a savior. And so that's what Paul would teach. Don't forsake the law of Moses. Just recognize its rightful place. It teaches you you need the Savior. The fourth thing was that righteousness comes not from adherence to the Mosaic law, but by faith in Jesus, which is almost a restatement of something I already said. But I wanted five points, not four. Romans chapter 3 talks about this. The fifth thing concerning circumcision, because who doesn't want to talk about circumcision on a Sunday morning? Here's what Paul said. He says it doesn't matter. You need Jesus. He says, if you want to be circumcised, go for it. If you don't want to be circumcised, go for it. All I care about is, do you know Jesus? That's Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, and then chapter 6, verse 15, in case you're wanting to take a notes. This is what Paul's message was. He didn't tell them to forsake Moses, but he wanted them to make sure that they held it in the proper, uh, with a proper understanding. That if you continue in these customs, don't you dare think that this adds to the cross. And we have to walk in that today like you, to, to, to remember and to know that your righteous works and like your good things, like we want to walk and, and live righteously, that's a good thing. But don't you think that God looks at you any different than he does because he sees you as perfect in Christ already. And so from that position of completeness, from that position of you're already blameless, you're already righteous, we get to do works now. We don't work to get to that position, you guys. That's the beauty of Christianity and what we have. It's called rest. That's why Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. But now Paul gets an opportunity to demonstrate and like, um, kind of like reconcile relationships with the Jews 
who believe in Jesus. Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now that's kind of a cool verse because there's some wiggle room <laughs> for having contention, I suppose. I've done, the, I've done as best I can to live peaceably with all men. Paul has an opportunity now to mend relationships. Now, a lot of people will say that he compromised in a serious way. He should have never done this. But it's, it's important to, to, for you guys probably to understand that there were certain ceremonies that a Jew would undertake that were an act of worship and not atoning for sin. If Paul was going to go and atone for sin for these guys, here's my I think, he would have never done it. He already had a massive blow up. Do you guys remember when he was fighting with Peter and Peter had left and, and wasn't hanging out with the Gentiles because, because people from James were there with him? And so he was eating with the Gentiles and then these guys came down, the Jews from Jerusalem, and then he stopped eating with the Gentiles. He's like, oh, okay, maybe I shouldn't be eating that way. So he came over here. And Paul said, what are you doing, Peter? You are being a hypocrite. And let him have it, right? Kind of had that conversation with him. He already had that. But here he has an opportunity to go and say, guys, it's fine. If you want to continue to worship God like you had and offer these sacrifices and consecrate your life, that's fine. It's not a work of righteousness. It doesn't justify you, but it can be an act of worship. You guys can live and, and say, Lord, I'm not going to do this, or I'm going to, I'm going to adhere strictly to this kind of a disciplined life. Why? Not because if I do it, God's going to like me more, but will it discipline you more? That's a good thing, right? Will it help you overcome maybe certain sins and certain patterns in your life? Like, amen, go for it. Nothing wrong with being diligent. Nothing wrong with living a life that is stringent and unholy, whatever it might be. There's nothing wrong with it. Just know that God sees you as he sees his son, Jesus. Because if it becomes something that you're doing to please God, now you're striving in the flesh and you are going to become exhausted. And this relationship that was once beautiful and real and good between you and the Lord now becomes transactional. And you lose what Christ had accomplished on the cross in relationship. Take that for what it's worth. <clears throat> we can never entertain sin. Um, there comes a point where my compromise becomes too much. I want to, I wanna, like Paul compromised here. He went and took these guys. He says, listen, if this will if be a blessing for you guys, I'll do it. But there does come a point where it becomes sin, and we have to know. This is discernment. We just got to be in the Word and be learning what it means. <clears throat> When does my um, compromise with the world, right? I'm, tr I'm trying to reach people and I'm trying to, to communicate with them, but when does it go too far? It's when you guys pray. Ask the Lord for wisdom and how you deal and walk through this world. Okay, now we get to this. This is what we'll wrap up with. In verse uh, 28, notice Paul's there. He had gone through and they're at the temple. Uh, throw, that, throw that picture of the temple up so people can look at something while they're listening, he blab on. <clears throat> men of Israel, help. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, this place, and furthermore, he has brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. They previously saw, this is Luke commenting, they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, whom they supposed Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together and seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. As they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. On the top right-hand side of this picture, there's this fortress thing. I don't know if you guys can see it but there's these four little fortress things. Rome had built a, a, a fortress right onto the temple, a temple complex, as a 100% Rome just saying, just so you Jews know, like we see you and we're in control. <laughs> there's no other reason than that. So there's this thing and there's a guy, uh, next week we're gonna talk about uh, uh, Claudius Lysias, the commander of this particular garrison, and, and a really neat story that I found, um, listen to Joe Foch, he has, he has a book of history about the Roman legions, and I'm going to read an excerpt from it. It's a, it's a fascinating history of this exact event that took place. It's really cool. Anyway, we'll get to that next week. 
but there they are. And I want you to think, how long would it take to go from that garrison? They, so all this, go, or this tumult's happening, they're beating him. And they, the Romans hear about it, and they, they organize their troops, and they were probably pretty quick. But then they go from that fortress all the way around into the temple and rescue Paul. Um, he got beat for a, a decent amount of time. I don't know, like two, three minutes. I don't know if you've ever been beaten before. I personally have not. Um, but a minute would be long enough. <laughs> two minutes, three minutes of people punching you and kicking you and a big crowd. Like that was the situation that he found himself in. Thankfully, this guy came and started taking care of him. The commander, this is verse 33, came near, took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains and asked, what in the world did you do to cause this kind of commotion? So then people said one thing. Everybody else was saying another. They couldn't ascertain the truth. He commanded Paul to be taken back to the barracks, which is that fortress right there. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. They were still trying to get him. When he reached the stairs, sorry, I already read that. The, for the multitude of the people followed after crying away with him. That was like a euphemism for we want him dead. They want him to be killed. What what they get so mad about? Um, I'll describe it like this and then we'll be done. <clears throat> you prob- okay, go to the next picture. Um, you guys see where it says Temple Mount. And if you squint really hard, on the left-hand side, you're going to see a line that comes down, and then you're going to see a section of the temple. What that was was a little barricade, and it separated where the Gentiles could go and where the Jews could go. And so sensitive was Rome to this issue. You might remember that Rome took away Israel's ability to, to, to do capital punishment, to kill. They left an exception for one thing, and that was if a Gentile crossed over that little bitty wall, uh, the Jews could stone him right there and then. And what the Jews were worried is that Paul, being a guy who's a a hater of all the customs, they think, took Trophimus into the temple and and defiled the temple. And it's a big deal. And so now they're mad about it. But what's interesting is that middle wall that's right there is spoken about, Paul talks about it in Ephesians. Um, which is after all these events that had taken place. Paul, sitting in prison after having been taken captive here in the book of Acts, um, he's writing to to the church in Ephesus, and he says in chapter 2, really verses 11 through 18, but um, verse 14 says, uh, and he himself became our peace. Talking about Jesus. He himself became our peace. And he has broken down the middle wall of separation. And what he's specifically referring to is that little wall that we see there in the temple. And what he goes on to say is that the work of Jesus on the cross has has broken down that which separated the Jew and the Gentile. That there's no excuse anymore for us to hold things against each other in terms of prejudice, where you're from, and so on. That the gospel tears all these things down. And it unites a group of people. What we see here happening on the temple mount was started because there was separation. But what Jesus has done is he's brought people together in a really unique way, which really goes back to this idea of community and fellowship that we have because of what Christ has done. That uh, we in here share something together and it's Jesus. Whereas we would have excuses and reasons for us to be separate and to maybe bicker and fight, which I know sometimes we can and we need to learn how to walk through these things. But Jesus unites us. And and the cause of the gospel is something that we all get to take part in and love one another in. That middle wall of separation that has been broken down because of Jesus, well, is, is so similar to that veil that was torn from top to bottom. Two things were broken down when Jesus did his work on the cross. The first one started in the Holy of Holies where the, te- the veil of the temple was torn. We now have access to the presence of God. Whereas before, sin kept me separated, but I now have access to the presence of God, and I will for eternity. And he also broke down this middle wall of separation. It's an odd place to end, but I want you guys to be encouraged that as we we leave from this place um, to walk in the finished work of Jesus, for you guys to be encouraged to wrestle and fight for unity among one another, 
and that the love of Jesus would bind us together, not the kind of love the world has, um, not the kind where we just affirm everything. It's not what love is. But love that's willing to, to pursue a person and love a person and, and invest in a person. Like, that's what I'm talking about. We desire that. And as we celebrate the work of the cross through communion, you guys, allow the Lord to minister to your heart um, that he has, he has called us and he's united us. <laughs> like, we have a family right here. And then together we would serve and love one another. When people come into this church, that they would feel love, the love of Jesus, and that you guys would walk in the freedom of what Christ has done, not striving to please God, but resting in the finished work of the cross. Let's pray, and then I'm just going to be done, okay? All right, Jesus, we ask for help in navigating through this. And as we just we finish this morning, it's like we just really need you to show us what it looks like to navigate all this, to walk in uh, loving people who have different convictions, helping people who are walking in sin, um, that we'd be patient and gracious with each other, remembering that you, Lord Jesus, have broken down that wall of separation that we now get to be close to each other. We get to have unity, fellowship, a closeness and an intimacy with people because of you. We just ask for help in, in knowing what that looks like and how we live it out on a daily basis. We trust you, Lord, that as we abide in you and enjoy you, that you'll speak very clearly to what that looks like. And so we present ourselves to you as a, as a body of believers. Lord, I, we, we ask that you would move in us, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and enable us to go out and do the work of ministry, the work of an evangelist, that you'd stir up your body and give us gifts, that you would raise up evangelists that would go and do that and that we here uh, would go out into the harvest and be used by you. Just nothing else matters. I pray you'd give us that heart of resolve to, to follow you no matter where it might lead us, to do the things that are uncomfortable and hard, but Lord Jesus, that you would be exalted he said if you were lifted up, that you would draw all men to yourself. And so we just ask for help. Enable us to do that. Put the gospel on our lips, Lord. Burden our hearts for people who are lost and hurting, that we would love them. We look to you now as we celebrate communion. We ask that you would, would bless this time. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, as you get the cup and the juice, hold on to it, and we'll take it together. Intoxicating in a secret place Cause your love is extravagant We're spread wide in the arms of Christ Love the cover sin. No great love have I ever known. You can say to me, a friend, capture my heart again. 
Cause your love is extravagant Your friendship is so Find I'm moving to the rhythm of your grace Your fragrance is intoxicating In a secret place Cause your love is extravagant covers sin and no greater love have I ever known you consider me a friend capture my heart again cause your Yes, your love is extravagant. All right. In Luke twenty two. Jesus is, uh, this is the Last Supper, right? And it says in verse 14, When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I love the statement. He has longed to do this with the disciples. I think he wants to do it with us. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and after he had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And so, just to think on that, he says, I have longed to do this. I've earnestly desired to do this with you. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. He says it multiple times. I think so much within the idea of the new covenant Right? We can come boldly to that throne room of grace and receive mercy and help and grace in our time of need, which is always. But Jesus has paid that through his broken body and through the blood that was shed. And we get to, we remember him. Do this in remembrance of me. And he has long to do this. And so let's just, let's reflect. Let's just sit and think on how great a salvation we have in this new covenant, right? That God so loved this world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him need not perish and have everlasting life. And if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus today as him as your king for forgiveness of sins, now is a good moment to say, Lord, forgive me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for conquering sin and death that I can have life in you. I can't do it on my own is what was said earlier, but you have done it all. So let's... Uh, Let's pray, and then we'll partake. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you that we have an audience with the King. Lord, it was only by the broken body and the blood of Jesus. Thank you for, Lord, your payment that we get the prize. Lord, we get you. And you said, do this in remembrance of me. We want to remember you. Lord, with the bread, with the blood. 
Lord, we just look, look back, Lord, and we look forward to seeing you face to face. But, Lord, we just do this in remembrance of you. And so let's partake in the name of Jesus. Oh, we stand and sing this last song together. Celebrate what the Lord has done.
cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasures you found. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. That you've broken down that middle wall, Lord, that separated us. Lord, we are welcomed onto the side of the chasm, Lord, that is at home with you for all eternity, Lord. There's, there's no weeping or crying, Lord. There's no more pain, Lord, when we see you. It's finished, Lord. We are in your arms, Lord. And we reckon that to be so as we live this life here, Lord, on earth. And um, we just live in the spirit, Lord. Lord, that heaven would be done here on earth, Lord. That is our prayer. Um, have your way in us, Lord, that we'd be made new every day in the perfect work of Jesus, Lord. We rest in you. So thank you again for what you've done, Lord. And um, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, everyone. Have a good week.
Blessed is a king who comes. Blessed is a king who comes in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. 